The Watership Down podcast is intended for listeners who are familiar with the plot. There will be spoilers. This episode is recorded, edited and narrated by Newell Fisher. It is scripted by Newell Fisher and Alan and Roz from the Rabbit Welfare Association and Fund. Hello and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 127 in which we'll be looking at Season 1, Episode 5 of the TV series, and Episode 5 of the series overall, The Shadow of Ephrapha. First, though, a bit of burrow keeping. Can I remind you again about our appeal to raise funds for the Rabbit Welfare Association and Fund via JustGiving.com, the link to which will be in the notes, or just search JustGiving.com under my name, Newell Fisher. The link to the RWAF website is also in the notes. I've had the following message from Alan and Roz at the RWAF that gives more detail about their work and why it is so important. Quote, We're so grateful to Newell for letting people know about us. The more people who hear about our work, the better, and we'll be able to help rabbits. Despite being a hugely popular pet, rabbits often live in poor, miserable conditions because their owners simply don't understand what they need to live healthy and contented lives. You may not know that you can become a Rabbit Welfare Association and Fund member and receive four copies a year of our fantastic glossy magazine, Rabbiting On, as well as lots of other benefits. If you're a rabbit owner, please join us. Check out rabbitwelfare.co.uk for details on how, how to join. We try to make pet rabbits' lives better in all sorts of ways. We provide information and guidance to rabbit owners, vets and the pet trade to help people better understand what rabbits really need. If they are looked after properly, they can live into their teens, which is a huge commitment that should not be taken lightly, but rabbits can bring great joy to owners who are prepared to put in the work. We're a campaigning organisation too. A lot of people don't know that we're in the middle of a rabbit welfare crisis as we speak. Lockdowns saw an increase in pets being taken on, and because rabbits are so cheap to buy, they proved to be very popular. Sadly, when people realised the reality of what was involved in their care, many tried to offload them to already overcrowded rescue shelters or simply abandon them in the wild to suffer a grisly fate. The cost of living crisis has made things even worse. Rescue shelters are bursting at the seams and unable to take on any more rabbits. To try to address this, we are working with government agencies to bring in legal protections for rabbits that cats and dogs already have, as well as bringing in licensing for rabbit breeders and making potential owners aware of what is involved when they take on rabbits, to stop the problem at source. And hot off the press, we are delighted that the organisers of several county shows have come to realise that the traditional rabbit show, where rabbits are displayed as exhibits in tiny wire cages, is cruel, and agreed instead to feature a setup where rabbits are in a much more natural environment that suits their welfare needs and provides a good example to owners. We'll keep on working so other county shows follow suit. Check out rabbitwelfare.co.uk to see what we're all about and find out, out more about the work we do. And don't forget to join us. End quote. So please give what you can to this very worthy animal welfare charity and consider joining too, especially if you're lucky enough to have rabbit companions. Because I received this while preparing this episode, I've delayed the start of going through Eric Stepp's account of his recent visit to the Watership Down area until next week. Another reminder that I am now showcasing Watership Down fan art by posting any that is submitted as the podcast title image on YouTube and posting the art on the podcast Instagram feed with no podcast title getting in the way, all of course with full credit given. I am not actively canvassing for contributions, so if you want to showcase your Watership Down themed art or know of someone else's art that you think should be, please get in touch with me either by social media or by emailing me at the Watership Down podcast, all one word, at outlook.com. Lastly, I will no longer be using the Twitter account, or whatever it's called now, for this podcast, and that account will just be an archive. From now on, it's just Facebook, Instagram and threads. And yes, I do realise that's very meta of me. Anyway, let's get back to the TV series. Because it's time to visit Ephrapha. Season 1, Episode 5, The Shadow of Ephrapha. The fifth episode of the Watership Down TV series was first broadcast in the UK on October 26th, 1999. It was written by Peter Colley. There will be a link to the full episode on YouTube in the notes. We open with an idyllic rural scene. 
a butterfly lands on a head of corn. Suddenly the piece is shattered as a rabbit runs fearfully, pursued by Campion and Vervain, who seem to do all the work in the Ephraphanalsla. Kiha, as it happens, is hovering overhead and looks concerned at the scene unfolding beneath him. The pursuit down a lane leads to woodland, where the rabbit being chased hesitates for a moment before hiding behind a tree. Campion stops and shouts, It's no good, Black of R. For the pursued rabbit, who is dark brown and has a wig of hair that resembles slightly the haircut of a member of a 90s boy, boy band, is indeed Black of R, voiced by Stephen Gately of Boyzone, who also sings Bright Eyes in this series. The terrified Blackavar is about to give up when a shadow looms over him. It is Kiha who says he will help him to get away. The terrified Blackavar gives up anyway and is knocked to the ground by Vervain before being led away. Kiha says what a poor little bunny and that he has messed up. How? I'm not exactly sure. Is Kiha learning some humility? Back on Watership Down, the huge burrow known as the Honeycomb is complete. The rabbits admire their work, but Hazel is still unhappy. As he goes outside, Dandelion and Hawkbit complain that Hazel is thinking again. Above ground, Hazel is joined by Bigwig and Fiverr. He is wondering how Kihar is getting on. Have he asked him to scout Ephrafa? Bigwig angrily asks him why. Hazel points out that he need more rabbits to join them. The only alternative to Ephrafa is the Warren of the Snares. Fiverr and Bigwig remind him of the viciousness of Woundwort, which prompts Hazel to point out that this must mean there are plenty of rabbits there who want to leave. And now we get our first view of the Ephrafa of the Watership Down TV series. It centres around a dead, twisted, misshapen tree that looms over what seems to be a small canyon. This is a reinvention of Ephrafa from its actual location at, at a bridleway crossroads near Overton in Hampshire and is designed to represent what Ephrafa is really about in visual form. The contrast of this twisted tree with the healthy looking tree on Watership Down is deliberate. Originalists will hate this reinvention, but let's remind ourselves that the 1978 film did the same with the Warren on Watership Down, making it based around a single lone tree rather than the beach hanger that it lies at the edge of in the novel. Kihar flies overhead and lands at the edge of the warren to observe the trial of Blackavar as Vervain self-importantly announces its beginning. Present among the group of rabbits watching the trial is a pale yellow doe called Primrose, who is basically Heisenslay given an easier name. The name Primrose is possibly significant though as it pays tribute to the flower that bookends the novel. She is voiced by Kate Ashfield, who played Sean's girlfriend Liz in Shaun of the Dead. And now the rabbits present bow down as Woundwort makes his first appearance on what can only be described as a balcony in the earth and rock wall held up by twisted roots. His distinctive fanfare plays. Woundwort is very dark grey in colour, with one white pupilless eye, the other being a deep red. He is voiced by John Hurt, who voiced Hazel in the 1978 film. In his gravelly voice, that of an older John Hurt and ideal for a villain, he asks Vervain what the charge is. It is attempted escape by Blackavar of the hind quarter mark, a phrase that is never explained. Without further ado, Woundwort dramatically announces the sentence of death, looming at the camera as he does so. We see Kihar's shocked reaction, then Primrose cries out, No! And now a hint of things to come. The previously brutal face of Campion looks sad. He intervenes, pointing out that the ancient laws of Ephrafa allow a defender for the condemned. But Vervain points out that Woundwort has spoken. This sets up a conflict in this Ephrafa, focused on Campion and Vervain, that makes, marks out a very different history for this warren to that of the book, where Ephrafa was founded by Woundwort at the location of his choosing, rather than being a pre-existing warren that he arrived at and took over. He did take over a warren in the novel, but it was not Ephrafa, which he later founded with his followers. Woundwort agrees to Primrose defending Blackavar as long as she agrees to share his fate. To Blackavar's horror, she agrees. As Primrose begins to defend him, an outraged Kihar swoops in screaming about a cat-faced bully and breaks up proceedings. Every rabbit scatters, except for Campion, Primrose and Blackavar. As Woundwort returns, Primrose points out that Blackavar did not try to use the chaos to escape. Angrily, Woundwalk commutes the sentence and returns down his run. The low growl that often accompanies him is heard. 
Campion tells Primrose to watch herself. It is not a threat. Back on Warship Down, Kihar is giving an angry account of what he saw at Afrafa. Hazel says this means there are rabbits who would leave if they could get them out. Dandelion and Hawkbit are true to form, sceptical about whether this can be done. In this worst version of Warship Down, Afrafra is a lot closer than in the book and is far more of an immediate threat. Bigwig counsels against provoking them before their new warren is up to strength. But Hazel reasons it is better for them to go to Afrafra than to wait for Afrafra to come to them. I have to say that this version of Hazel has judged, has judged this issue badly, as he will soon find out. Hazel, Fiverr, Bigwig and Kihar set off for Ephrafa. By nightfall they arrive at the Iron Road, and Kihar tells them that Ephrafa is on the far side of the river that lies beyond it. In the novel, of course, Ephrafa lay, lay on the north side of both, though it was still a lot further from Watership Down. Bigwig asks Hazel what his plans are as they approach the Iron Road. He basically doesn't have any, beyond deciding whether it, it is worth negotiating with Woundwort or tricking him. The three rabbits sit on the iron road discussing what it is. And then the most extraordinary thing happens. A train from the continent of North America sounds its horn in the distance. And I know it is from North America, either the US or Canada, because as far as I know, literally no train in the UK sounds like that. Before they know it, this specially imported train is on top of them. Fiverr goes farm and has to be knocked out of the way by Hazel, who had made it off the tracks. Fiverr obviously knows his train horn sounds and is wondering how they got a whole train all the way over the Atlantic to rural Hampshire, and why. I mean, the gauge is the same in Britain, that is to say the standard gauge of 1435 millimetres or 4 feet 8.5 inches, but there is an abundance of rolling stock here, so no need at all to be shipping trains over the Atlantic at great expense. Yes, I am being sarcastic. But this kind of Americanization does annoy me, and I am aware I'm saying this to an audience just over half of which is in the US and Canada, to be exact, 47% US and 4% Canada. I just don't understand why a story, much of the charm of which is that it is set in rural England, has to be transplanted in this way. It is something the 2018 Netflix series takes to a further extreme. It is just so unnecessary, and to be honest, quite lazy. Anyway. When Hazel knocks Fiverr off the track, they land on the opposite side to where Bigwig is, giving him a few tenth seconds before he find, finds out if they made it. They wonder what the train was, in company with any train spotters out and about that night, I imagine, but Hazel concludes that it meant them no harm. They were just in its way. Continuing on, at dawn they encounter a scarecrow in a field which terrifies them at first until Kiha lands on it. Fiverr concludes it's some kind of man trick. Bigwig tries to make out it didn't work on him, but has to admit it did a bit. Hazel can smell the river, so they carry on. They reach a plank bridge across what I'm still going to call the River Test. Kihar says this is the only way across, as another bridge is guarded by African guards. Hesitantly, they cross. In a total departure from the original story, they all arrive at Ephrafa, rather than just Bigwig, and observe rabbits at Silflay being watched by guards, who would normally be looking out for a lil. Bigwig is shocked by this. A brief shot of the twisted tree of Ephrafa shows guards sitting on its branches at a scale that suggests it is huge. In other shots, the scale is very different. This kind of distortion of scale takes this animation firmly further towards abstraction, as discussed by Maureen Furness, who is cited in Catherine Lester's book on the 1978 film. Kihar spots Blackavar and Primrose. Needless to say, in this animation aimed at children, Blackavar is completely unmutilated after his escape attempt. Hazel sees Primrose for the first time and repeats her name. As he does this, we see his face change in a way that suggests a, a drastic lowering of his IQ. This is the moment where romance enters the storytelling world of Watership Down for the first time. In Tales from Watership Down, Hazel and Heisenthay are a couple, but there remains no hint of romantic love. It is purely a pragmatic arrangement, it seems, as such couples are in the original novel. And the 1978 film stuck to this approach. But for better or worse, as I have said before, romance has arrived at the animated Watership Down and is here to stay. Primrose, by sheer chance, tells Blackavar to slip into the brambles where the Watership Down rabbits are hiding. Obviously, she means to escape with him. There they meet Hazel. 
He begins to explain that they are there to get them out of Efrafa, but they are interrupted by a shout from Vervain, who arrives with Campion and tells them they are off their mark, so their sylphlay is over. Just then, Fiverr stupidly treads on a twig. Vervain hears this and is just about to investigate when Primrose shouts at Blackaval to run. They run in the opposite direction to where the watership down rabbits are, preventing them from being found, and are rapidly caught. Hazel realises this. Bigwig asks if he still thinks there is any point negotiating with this warren. Hazel admits there isn't, but they are getting Primrose and Blackavar out in any case. And then Fiverr has one of his rhyming visions, saying, The only way out is to go straight through. If two go in, then out come two. Hazel bizarrely decides this means that two of them had to go into Ephrafa in order to get Primrose and Blackavar out. It seems his lowered IQ is still in effect, and Bigwig and Kihar tell him if this is a really bad idea. Hazel tells Bigwig and Kihar to be ready to back them up. He tells Bigwig to take over at Watership Down if things go wrong. Fiverr wishes he didn't have visions at times like this, and that Hazel didn't trust them. Bigwig says they are both mad, which might just get them through this. An interesting military theory. Bigwig and Kihar move off to find cover. Back at Ephrafa, Vervain and Campion emerge from a guarded entrance, having presumably taken Primrose and Blackavar underground. Vervain wonders what gets into these rabbits. The conversation that follows tells us a lot about Campion and Vervain. Campion says his guess is that they don't like it at Ephrafa, that things have changed since Woundwort arrived. As he says this, they pass a group of rabbits at Silfle under close guard. Vervain says what Campion said sounds suspiciously like disloyalty. Campion responds that he is Owsler, and that Woundwort is our chief but it is clear that his loyalty is qualified. Their conversation is interrupted by Hazel and Fiverr, who meet them in the open. Hazel asks to be taken to their leader. And so we depart utterly from the original story, in which neither of them even see Ephrafa. To a dramatic fanfare, they are taken underground and arrive at a burrow blocked by a large disc-shaped boulder and guarded by two large rabbits, one of whom rolls it aside. So it's a cell with a door, another departure from naturalism. Inside the cell they join Primrose and Blackavar. Primrose asks if they were caught, but Hazel says no, they gave themselves up. Blackavar seems a little irritated by this. After all, the only reason he and Primrose are in the cell at all is because they try to prevent Hazel et al from getting caught, but Primrose seems a little more forgiving as Hazel says they had to see them again. They stare at each other for a moment before Hazel re-engages his brain and introduces Fiverr. Primrose asks Fiverr if Hazel is just a bit mad. Fiverr humorously says he has his moments. While in a cell. I wouldn't be laughing. Vervain and Campion report to Woundwort, who is sitting on his raised platform, not looking at all insecure. Campion reports Hazel has said he is chief of a great warren. Vervain comments he doesn't look much like a chief. Campion says that Hazel has come to ask which Woundwort prefers. War or peace? Life or death? Increasingly, Hazel is looking mad. Woundwort does not even react. In the cell burrow, Hazel is selling the merits of the warren on Watership Down. Primrose asks him to stop, and Blackavar adds that they don't dare dream of better places than Ephrafa. The cell door stone slides aside, and Vervain informs po Primrose and Blackavar that they are being freed so they can watch Woundwort deal with Hazel and Fiverr. The rabbits of Ephrafa are gathered to Kihar's relief from his hiding place. Apparently he finds watching bunnies boring. Hazel and Fiverr are brought out under guard. Seeing Primrose, Hazel promises her he will get her out. She says she believes him, and they touch paws before being separated by an angry guard. High above them, Woundwort is already sitting on his raised platform. As soon as Hazel notices him, Woundwort gives his answers which unsurprisingly are, in order, war and death. At that last word he looms forward. Vervain smirks in the background. He adds that as he has answered all Hazel's questions, both he and Fiverr will now be executed on his command. Hazel and Fiverr look shocked, but honestly, what did they expect? By the way, just a reminder that this is a f tamer version of Warship Down aimed at children. So what is Hazel's master plan here? 
As another advertising break passes, the rabbits who will carry out the sentence loom menacingly over the condemned. Bigwig, watching this, intends to attack, but Kiha reminds him of Fiverr's vision about two coming out. He must trust Hazel. Under threat of death, Woonwalt demands to know where Hazel's warren is if he wants to live. Hazel refuses. Woundwalt scores the earth with his claws and declares to all of Ephrafer that he will destroy Hazel's great warren, that those who live there will obey Woundwalt and live through him. But now something is happening to Fiverr. He seems to be going into a trance. As Woundwalt walks away, he commands the execution to begin, and Fiverr cries out the words, Dark Haven is destroyed. Woundwalt looks shocked beyond measure. Vervain is about to strike, but Woundwart cries, Hold! He cannot believe he has heard the word Darkhaven. Fiverr is still in a trance, but this vision does not rhyme. He cries out about a field on fire and a man with a gun, then shouts, Save him, Laurel! Briefly, we see two rabbits in a field looking at a raging fire. He has named Woundwart's mother. He orders the meeting place cleared. Bigwig asks Kiha what just happened, but he has no idea. Was this really Hazel's big plan? For Fiverr to have a huge, earth-shattering vision? What are we missing here? Woundort jumps down from his platform and says that only the Black Rabbit of Inlay could know these things. But Fiverr hasn't finished. He cries out about a weasel coming through the bushes, shocking Woundort again, about being too tired to run. The camera zooms in on Woundort's blank eye and we are suddenly in flashback. A young Woundwart is with his mother. They are trapped between a fire and a vicious weasel. She smiles lovingly at Woundwart and leaps at the weasel. We see the young Woundwart's face as he watches in horror, then covers his eyes. And now we are back with adult Woundwart, who has also covered his eyes. He cries out for Fiverr to get out of his head. Fiverr collapses. This vision to end all visions is over. Woundwart demands to know who Hazel is and what Fiverr is. Hazel says he is from a great warren with a huge Owsler. Moving to the edge of the meeting place, he says they have surrounded Ephrafa. Bigwig gets it immediately and tells Kiha to rustle the line of bushes they are in to make it look like there are many rabbits hiding in them. It works. Vervain reacts with fear, Campion with anger. Hazel warns of the consequences of harming them. Fiverr's dark spirit will haunt Woundwort forever. Woundwort is livid, but they are allowed to leave. Vervain even warming Campion to stay away from them. As Hazel and Fiverr scramble out of the dip Afrafra lies in, Campion asks for Woundwart's orders. He seems to have forgotten Hazel's warning and tells him to track them down and destroy them, then their warren. He doesn't seem very happy. Campion discovers that there is only one rabbit in the bushes to add to Woundwart's humiliation. And so the chase is on. Fiverr is exhausted quite quickly, but Bigwig forces him to carry on, not very politely. Hazel shouts at Kihar that they need a dist distraction to slow the Afrafans, so he hides under the hat of the Scarecrow and tries to sound human. This works for a moment until he falls off, but it has helped, and Vervain has run away. The two remaining Afrafans realise that this seagull is with them. The pursuit continues. They reach the plank bridge and all cross except for Campion, who falls in the river and is swept away. As night draws in, they reach the Iron Road, just as another North American train approaches. The three watership down rabbits get across just in time, and Woundort is prevented from pursuing by the passing train. As the train passes, and the watership down rabbits are nowhere to be seen, Woundwort growls his curses into the night. The usual stuff, all about having nowhere to hide and hunting the outsider until Frith falls from the sky. As they stay hidden, Big Rig points out that this hasn't been much of a success. Fiverr adds that they have also made a dangerous enemy. Hazel, rather than apologising, asks Fiverr about his vision. He has never seen one like it before. Fiverr says he hopes he never has one like it again. Woundwort, he adds, is full of hate, fear and loss. Hazel points out it saves their lives. And two did indeed come out, Big Rig adds. But Hazel is sad about the two left behind. We see a flashback to Primrose and their paws touching, and looking in the sky in the direction of Ephrafer, he promises to return. Not today, chum, comments Bigwig. The camera pans up to the sky.
Is it canon? This episode seems at first to be steering back in the direction of the original story. However, it is actually the episode, as it turns out, where the Watership Down TV series moves on very decisively to its own story, one that has little to do with the 1972 novel. We will return in later episodes to recognisable parts of the original plot, but we have also here had a firm introduction to plot lines that will carry us through the rest of this series that are in no way canon, but are interesting. This is where this series really starts to have the courage to tell its own story and the term Dark Haven will loom large later on in the story. Its introduction here, in a children's animation, in such a dramatic way, I think, marks this out as one of unusual quality, because the mystery of Dark Haven will not be referred to again for quite some time, giving Woundwater a backstory that will remain mysterious, for now. This episode, as I have said before, for better or worse, also introduces the concept of romance into the Watership Down t- storytelling universe, and it is a concept that will remain in film versions of the story right up to the date I'm recording these words. It is interesting that an animation aimed at children felt the need to do this. It is probably a phenomenon worthy of wider academic analysis, but not here. This is also the first episode in which Hazel falls from grace as a tactician when compared to the book, His bad judgment should have got him and Fiver killed, and he has made a deadly enemy for nothing. His plan to get Doze out of Ephrafa in the novel, by comparison, is a work of strategic and tactical genius, and the Ephrafans finding the Warren on Watership Down was by no means a given. But this Ephrafa is far closer by. Not the kind of enemy you need for the sake of one Doe who who your chief has fallen for. So, overall, canon? Absolutely not. Worthy of note? Absolutely. After all, we've never met Hazel, the love-struck idiot, before. Next time, we forget about Afrafa for now, as the rabbits of Watership Down raid Nuthanger Farm. That was Hazel's idea, too. <laughs>